So welcome to the Power to Speak podcast, Georgina Ash. Uh, it's lovely to have you here. Georgina, you are a, a, a videographer, um, so video producer working with small businesses, but mainly founder of Grub Productions. So tell us a little bit about Grub Productions before we, before we kick off with the other questions. Um, well, thank you for ha having me, Jackie. It's really lovely to be here. Um, I set up Grub Productions a few years ago when I relocated from London to Dorset and thought I'd branch out on my own. And as you said, you know, keen to work with small businesses and small charities. I come from the charity background, so I'm always very keen uh, to help out that not-for-profit sector. And I suppose it's my comfort zone. Um, so, yes, I set up uh, Grub Productions uh, slightly as a means to an end, but also just to have the flexibility and embrace a different uh, pace of life after having done the kind of London thing for, for 10 years. Yeah. And so where are you living now then? Because you've moved out of London, haven't you? You're, you're in the countryside. In Yeah, gone a bit more rural. So down in Purbeck in Dorset, if anyone's familiar with that part of Dorset. So near, you know, between Swanage and Corfe Castle. So very pretty, a lovely mix of green fields and yet surrounded by sea. So it's perfect. brilliant beautiful but that's that's kind of what you're used to isn't it because you 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 come from a foreign land you come from from across the sea <laughs> just, yeah just the channel so yeah I'm I'm originally from Guernsey in the Channel Islands so yeah you're right I do like being near and surrounded by the sea it does feel very familiar to me and I like to be within reaching distance of the sea so I've I, I would happily have ended up living in Guernsey but as it turns out I, I married a stonemason um, and here on the Jurassic Coast is is a very lovely place to be. Yes, and it's perfect for stone. I mean, obviously, it's it's world renowned for its stone there, isn't it? Yes, yeah. I mean, I, I have to say, I don't know nearly as much about it as I should now after several years of marriage. But um, yes, all the kind of Jurassic limestone, the Purbeck limestone is very famous. It's full of fossilised shells and things. Um, there's lots of different kind of beds and in fact grub is named after a bed of Purbeck stone uh, so it's a particular layer I don't know where how deep or anything uh, but it's a particular layer that has a kind of fossilized blue shells so I did name it after after this part of the world. Beautiful beautiful so tell us a little bit about your your journey then from Guernsey to here how did how did that sort of transpire because you're talking about fossils and you know all things natural you have sort of a bit of a scientific background background as well don't you so how you ended up in videography and uh, producing videos how how did that come about tell us a little bit about the journey yeah, well, stop me if I waffle on for too long. I suppose it's one of those things that's sort of completely planned and also slightly accidental at the same time, if, if that's of, of any comfort to anyone out there. I didn't really have a plan. And um, I, I often just sort of bounce along from one thing to the next. And if something sounded interesting, I'd, I'd go for that. So I, I studied anthropology as an undergrad because it sounded quite varied, the study of man, and, and I had, you know, the bits of primatology, bits of uh, archaeology, bits of kind of cultural and art studies. So I, I liked that, that there, there was a bit of everything. But I actually sort of fell in love with primatology quite a bit, ended up interning, ended up um, interning at the Natural History Museum in the paleontology department, uh, and a sort of was a bit of a wannabe scientist. And I ended up doing a master's in primate conservation. So I was particularly interested in wildlife, in primatology, um, in habitat and, and things like that. Um, and I discovered really what I suspected all along is that I'm a terrible scientist <laughs> and I'm much better suited to, to science communication. And I suppose at the same time, I'd always had this interest in photography and wildlife documentaries, you know, BBC, David Attenborough, all that stuff. So it all sort of finally came together that I ended up working for an animal charity in the communications department, working in film and photography, but for a very kind of important cause, uh, which was animal welfare. Yeah. So yeah, finally, after sort of, you know, there was no really clear path to me, it just there was a lot of wiggling and a, and a lot of sort of blindly going out there thinking, am I even going in the right direction? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's the, the case for lots of people. I certainly, you know, my career has been sort of jungle gym rather than career ladder. It's kind yeah. of gone all over the place, to, to, you know, for me to get here now. So when you say animal communication or primate communication, what do you mean? Is that is that the kind of the the, the fil filming and promotional side of it? Is that is that what you mean? Yes. Yeah, so sorry, science communication. So so I'm not really the scientist that's very good at um, 
you know, doing sort of research methods and statistical analysis. In fact, I'm terrible at it, but I might be really good at explaining why that stuff's really important. So I didn't work in the science team. I worked in the communications team and exactly that. We took care of all the publications, all the kind of leaflets, all the posters, all the kind of paraphernalia that, that came out from our program and science team and making sure that you're translating it and distilling it so that it's it's understood by the right audience, whether that, that was the kind of policy makers at quite top level positions or whether that's, that's you know, Mrs. Smith who likes to donate three pounds a month. So just making sure you're, you're making it fit for the right audience. Yeah. Uh, so really amazing kind of learning uh, experience. Yeah, and is that is did you have the love of photography before you started that, or is that where it came from? And did you have more of a, an opportunity to play with film and, and photography while you were there? Um, a bit of both. I'd always had a bit of an interest. I'd done a couple of courses here and there back in the old days when you still had film and developed it and and things like that. But I could I wouldn't t say that I was proficient at it. But certainly by being in the right place at the right time and getting chucked in the deep end a few times, I started to kind of pick up a few things and. For me personally, I think there's still a lot more room to grow. I still feel that the technology is advancing all the time. It's quite complex, you know, video and photography. I'm still learning. I don't feel, feel like I've nailed it yet, but I enjoy that process. Yeah. Yeah. So so what's what's your favourite thing to to film? Is it is it still wildlife and na natural stuff that you like to film? Um. <laughs> they always say don't work with children you know don't work with children and animals and I found myself with both I did I really enjoyed the filming uh for the charity and 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 filming wildlife or 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 even just you know domestic animals dogs and things like that um I think there's a real satisfaction of knowing that you've captured something I was once filming a it's really sad actually a tiger that was in captivity in Thailand and it was chained and most likely drugged and I remember as awful as that scene was knowing I'd got the footage that I could take back to the charity and it would actually have some value we'd be able to communicate about how awful this thing is that's going on and this is what it looks like and raise money from it there's a real kind of job satisfaction that sounds a bit twisted because it's such an awful thing but you've you know you've done you know I came away from that thinking I I've I've done what I needed to do I've, I've captured it yeah then I then I hand that over and then it became more powerful and yeah. um, so that that will always stay with me as you know for a long period of time that's what I did now I think it's 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 different I've evolved and I'm working a lot more with people and small business owners and I think there's a new satisfaction in in helping people communicate helping people seem be more visible helping people overcome their fear of being filmed um and and actually you know when you have a happy client when you do a job for them and they're they're really appreciative because it's, it's so small you know you're working with small businesses you can really see that you've made a, an impact so yeah yeah I mean there's, there's a lot of that impact thing in in photography isn't there I mean this is journalistic just documenting what you see in front of your eyes it's just incredible so you were obviously sent a way to to film quite a lot not 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 regularly regularly but about once a year I'd get a sort of big trip um I mean I used to be so jealous of my colleagues in the early days when they'd go off to all these glamorous places and they'd they'd really just end up staying in a kind of air-conditioned room for three days having a meeting <laughs> and when it was sort of finally my turn to go you know I got really great field trips so I never had to do aircon and board meetings I'd be sort of out I did homestays in in the South Pacific I would visit ranches in Colombia and dog vaccination programs in Sierra Leone so I you know it was absolutely my dream job you know the, yeah. the kind of mix of travel and the animals and the creativity and the you know all sort of came together. So is that where you you were drinking umbongo in the Congo? <laughs> No, that was before, actually. That was um, quite a funny mission I found myself on, or a bit of a volunteer thing, where uh, I, I came by, by a very long story. I came a, a, to, to be in contact with a group of people who wanted to go to Africa, do a bit of research, and they really wanted to work with primates, and they just didn't have a primatologist. And as it happened, my brother introduced me to them not long after I'd qualified, after I'd got my, my master's. So I ended up with them. And we went, I think we went to Uganda 
the Congo and Kenya and somebody of the group had managed to track down Umbongo, which I don't think has been seen in the supermarkets for quite a while. And I don't know how she, she sort of got it out there and, and kept it very quiet until we got to the Congo. And then she just produced this sort of, you know, a few, a few of those little boxes, little cartons. For anyone that doesn't remember, it was a juice drink, yeah. um, probably in the 90s. And then we drank Umbongo in the Congo, which was very, as silly as it sounds, very yeah. silly. Yeah. So how long did you do that job for? That's, it sounds like an amazing, amazing job to have. The, the kind of the, with the charity. Yeah. So I ended up spending 10 years with them because I really, you know, I started off so green and really cut my teeth with them. Not, not just with the film and photography, but also just what it takes to run a global charity and all the sort of different elements and how you work together. And, um, you know, there's a lot of kind of, politics and red tape and all that stuff so it was really it was really sort of fascinating to learn and I remember I, you know I did think for a long time I'll, I'll leave when I'm not learning anymore and actually even when I did leave I, I you know there was more to give um, but it was just my circumstances had changed and life had relocated to Dorset and commuting and all that, yeah. that stuff so yeah so so once you'd moved out did you is that when you started grow up or was there a bit of a were you doing something else I think for a while I just, uh, Grub was a little bit of a side hustle. It didn't even really have a name. It didn't have a, it certainly didn't have a strategy. Um, and I and I just sort of explored a few bits and bobs while I was temping and actually just really appreciated being still for, for the first time in a few years having commuted. I'd also fairly recently lost my mum. So it was nice just to kind of decompress a bit and not be dashing around the country and not be, um, you know, and just, yeah, just sort of enjoy the simple life for a moment in time uh, and slow things right down and then after about a year or so of that then I sort of was able to start grub a bit more earnestly and and give it a bit more of the time and attention that it needs when you're starting a business yeah, yeah. so in that time out did you use photography as a as a sort of a an outlet a creative outlet sort of for, for well-being or I'm not sure I did actually I think in some ways I, I don't know if anyone else would sort of resonate with this, but I think sometimes you just need to step away uh, for, from things for a bit and just, you know, have to have that moment to decompress and, and sort of think about um, something else or not think about anything really. Yeah. I, think I, I needed a period in, in my time when I just needed to not really be thinking about anything and coordinating anything. And there was a time when I was sort of living in, in Dorset, commuting up to London for work, trying to get to Guernsey while my mum was poorly. And, and just that sort of, um, constant flow just was you know I just needed to not not think about anything for a little bit yeah yeah and so once once grub started was it specifically to work with small businesses how did how did you sort of niche down as to as to what you to what you are now doing with grub how did that come about I think just all very organically I don't know if I you know I was very naive about what it took to start a business I mean like you know well hopefully I've got some kindred spirits out there but oh, you, know, yeah. Hello. <laughs> you know you think okay well I I know how to operate this camera and I know how to edit footage with this software I'll start a business and you know have absolutely zero clue about um you know managing your money thinking of strategy being you know having a marketing plan so just sort of jumped in with with <laughs> you know and then as you, you know you learn as you go along and you figure out what's right for you and where's your comfort zone and then how you grow and push yourself out of that comfort zone yeah. so I think it just yeah all fairly sort of organically came together that I ended up working with um small businesses and I think to be honest coming from the charity background um where you learn how to do everything on a shoestring you know we had one piece of really good kit and you sometimes had to fight over it who needed it where were you going with it can I borrow it after you 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 know on a shoot it was really very limited crew I might hire somebody local I might do a little bit of filming at the same time um I think only on one shoot did I did we have a, a sound person mm -hmm. you know so I, I came at it from quite a frugal background so the idea of then going pitching to big organizations who were wanting kind of agency style glossy production that just wasn't my my bag and that's not what, what I was really offering and I, I seem to suit um, the smaller businesses those that are starting out those that have got a sort of more limited budget those that are intimidated by video as well mm -hmm. don't yeah. want you turning up with blinding lights and all the kind of kit and caboodles. So I, th I suppose it was a sort of natural 
process. Yeah. I mean, there's something quite creative, isn't there, about sort of pulling all those things together. I mean, I, you know, people have the thing about creativity being about drawing and painting, but actually it's just about problem solving and, and finding solutions to those problems. So if you, as you say, if you've got to go to the other side of the world and take this equipment with you and you've got to hire people and get people in, you've got to set up shots and things like that, that's, that's something quite creative. And then to bring that into the small business arena as well and running your own business, did you find sort of a synergy in that? Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. I, I think I think you're absolutely right. I think for me, uh, working uh, sort of under pressure, and and I mean, and you know, quite sort of limited pressure, but but the sort of you know, you've got time constraints, you've got money constraints, things like that. I think for me, because I'm definitely no artist, you know, and um, I think for me, creativity means freedom, and and freedom to imagine and freedom to create, and I think even actually we used to sort of complain sometimes when you work for an organization you work under or within a brand you feel quite hemmed in oh, I want to have a you know a red line when no all the lines are blue or, or whatever your kind of fonts and but actually the possibilities are so endless it's quite nice to, to, to challenge yourself and go how can I be creative within this brand how can I push it a little bit how can I take it right up to the to the line um so yeah, I think there is something quite enjoyable about now working with with a few different people and their different brands and their different sort of tones of voice and and what they're trying to communicate. So um, yeah, I enjoy. Sorry, back to your point. I I really like the problem solving. I like that thinking on your feet and how we're going to make this work and something broke and what how we're going to fix it and we forgot something. Um, how can we improvise? Yeah, I think that's quite fun and I feel like I kind of really come alive in those moments um and I've got lots of lovely memories you know having done that in the field in the past but but you know nowadays it's just slightly more small scale yeah yeah and you were saying that obviously people that come to you some some are, are quite intimidated by the equipment and do you think do you think that people don't um don't enjoy being in front of uh in front of a camera and that you you know you have to really kind of coddle them into coming out of their shell because there's something isn't there I don't know I mean obviously with the work that I do with people around their voices and showing up and presenting themselves whether it's on camera or on a stage or whatever it is that kind of needing permission to be able to actually open their mouths and and speak or just show up you had yeah. Problems with that. yeah I mean I I suspect there are a lot of people that that don't even come to me because the idea of being anything to do with video is so horribly off-putting and and those that do more often than not do need that little bit of coaxing and we all have those moments and it's perfectly normal and somebody could be talking eloquently and and comfortably about something about their subject area and then as soon as you sort of put a lens in the way <laughs> they they tense up and become very self-conscious so it's, I suppose it's about trying to encourage them through that and um and help people sort of get you know get over that uh, a little bit I think you know um even sometimes just the smartphone makes people clam up and they're not you know they're not comfortable even filming themselves a short clip so yeah it's definitely working with people yeah so so yeah because I have that same similar problem as well is just trying to get people to make that first step is just to to do it just play with with the camera play with your speech play you know with whatever it is that you've got just get used to doing it so how do you encourage them what's what's your your tip <laughs> give me some tips to, how can how can i help other people i think um in my experience quite a lot of people are real perfectionists and they don't want to go on camera until everything is right and nothing will ever always, you know, not everything will always be right. So I think it can be, it can be for physical reasons, like we've come out of lockdown, I haven't had my hair done yet. Or um, no, I don't, I was gonna buy a new tripod, I was gonna upgrade my phone. So it, it can be, you know, or it can be, I don't, I don't know what my business strategy is yet. So people really put a lot of blocks in their way and worry as well about how they come across on camera whether they stumble, whether they say um and ah, whether they, and I, you know, I always say, first of all, just forget about being perfect. Just let, just, you have to get over that and you have to let that go. 
and I, you know, I say to people, I want you to be able to, like you say, practice, just keep having a go. The, the more you do, the better you get. And you want to kind of be looking back at your early videos and cringing because they're a bit naff and you've come along so far, but we've got to start somewhere to improve. Um, and, you know, I say to people, if you walked into a room and introduced yourself and made a mistake, you wouldn't walk back out and come in and have take you know it doesn't work like that in real life so sometimes you just got to accept take a few takes of course when you're filming and that's the beauty of digital is it you know on your phone you can record six takes if you like but at some point you've just got to accept you know what this is what I look like this is what I sound like and this is what I've got to say and as long as my main message is is out there we move on and and post it get on with it get it out there and then improve the thing the thing that people struggle with as well is reviewing their own material and that's something I really do try and encourage because you won't improve and you won't learn if you can't even look back even if it's a bit cringy but just go oh okay I noticed that actually I don't make eye contact at all with the camera or I stumbled over that particular why do I struggle with that particular explanation or whatever it is so I do try and encourage people to review their material yes and see what they can learn. I, I, I do the same thing, you know, if they can, if I can record anything, anything we're doing on Zoom, certainly, if I can record it and send it over to them that they can, they can have a look at. I think that's, that is really, really useful. Um, but I, I am the world's, I, I am my own worst enemy in lots of ways. And I, I don't know about you. How, how are you on camera? Do you enjoy it? <laughs> um, no, I've, de I've definitely had my, my moments where I feel a bit uncomfortable. The beauty is I can do it on my own. And uh, there might not be a witness. No, I definitely, I've definitely had moments. I think it's part, again, it's just practice, practice. So when I've worked with other photographers, other videographers, as I have over the years, more often than not, you'll have to stand, you know, in front of the lens while they're setting up and they're testing the light and they're testing the audio. And you get used to just being a sort of bod on camera and making sure that, you know, cause that's just sort of helpful helping people set up. And again, just over time, you get used to it and since I've been running Grub Productions and just getting in the habit of talking to my my mobile phone and posting that stuff out again just the more you do it the easier it is and I think I've got to like you we've got to sort of demonstrate uh, that, that you can do it and you can get over it so yeah you've got to, yeah. I've got to put my money where my mouth is <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah no because it, it occurred to me actually that now obviously we are on Zoom and have been on Zoom for the last year um, that I when I was acting, obviously I come from an, an acting background, I didn't do lots and lots of acting, but you never see yourself when you're on stage. Mm -hmm. So you walk onto a stage, you do a performance, apart from anything else, you're playing somebody else, and then you walk off and you, you never see what you looked like, you, never, you don't listen to your own voice from outside. Um, so to then be on Zoom, all the time when you're you know you've got you've got an image of yourself there that you're looking at uh, and you know I'm the world's worst for looking at the camera I am mm -hmm. naturally drawn to the person I'm talking to which is very difficult uh, so what what do you um how, how do you coax people on zoom to actually look in the correct place and and you know in the kind of the zoom thumbnail that they have how do how do they sort of present themselves well, I think Zoom has actually done a lot of us a lot of favours because A, it helped us get to grips with new technology and B, it did get us used to the idea that we're on camera and, you know, deal with it. Um, I think there's, you know, there's obviously a few, a few tricks you can do here and there. Uh, you can actually switch your own reflection off your video off because also when I film if I use my smartphone to film I try not to film in selfie mode because a bit like you you get so distracted with your own odd reflection uh, so what I have uh, if I'm just filming is I have a little look arrow to point at the little lens so that I remember to make eye contact with it so post-it notes is probably one of my biggest tips Yes. But it's it's so unnatural, isn't it, to sort of, you know, be looking at a camera when you're actually talking to a person, it doesn't, you know, and I think that is the problem that people have. The other, the other um, thing that I get quite a lot from people is that they, when they're looking at a lens, they're not sure who's behind it kind of thing. If they're doing lives, specifically now, you know, within lockdown, we've, lots of people have turned to Facebook Live, YouTube mm. lives um, and actually not knowing who's watching you I think it can be quite intimidating mm. for some people 
I find that quite liberating actually I don't know yeah that's interesting I find that quite quite good I don't know who you know that's one of the tips I do say to people when you're recording is don't imagine all the people that might watch it just just imagine one friend of yours who is not in your industry so you are avoiding jargon and you're just having quite a a relaxed and comfortable conversation, a natural conversation with a friend of yours. So I actually try not to imagine who's out there watching it and I find that easier. I mean, I have spoken in live rooms before and I think that I miss the days when you could see somebody's body language, you could see and interpret somebody's sort of, you know, visual cues that they were enjoying something or not enjoying something. And I think that that can in of itself be quite off-putting or intimidating but for me I find that quite sort of it, it feeds the energy for me as I'm going along and, and that transition when I started doing presentations and workshops over zoom and you're getting nothing you might even have a blank screen uh, is was brutal for me at first I, I didn't enjoy that initially now I think I'm again just practice just getting more used to it yeah um, so how have, how has your work changed then in lockdown how have you managed to do your work over the last year so I think, I suppose in some ways, you know, Grub, Grub Productions was still quite a new business when we went into lockdown. So it was quite easy to make alterations and adaptations because it wasn't sort of long established in a certain way. And like a lot of people, you know, you just look at the pandemic and go, okay, what's working, what's not working, I'll lean into that. So in some ways it did me a favor. I was able to upscale my I do smartphone workshops so I was able to deliver those to more people at once online you know didn't have to travel um could deliver that to kind of more than one person at once I started doing group workshops um far less obviously filming in person I, I can probably count on one hand the number of times I've managed to do it over the last year but editing a lot of remote projects so lots of people that are filming themselves so people that are doing it either via zoom or via their smartphone and then they're sending me the footage and I'm able to package that up for them so you know initially I just thought oh well this is awful I'm not gonna I'll never work again you know my business will have closed before it even began but actually I've been amazed at the at the ways I have been able to do a bit of work perhaps not my most creative work perhaps not my most um challenging work and I slightly miss the the filming side of things yeah. and worrying about being a bit too comfortable without it and being you know the next time I go out being sort of more nervous than yeah. uh, than usual because it I feel quite rusty now yes no I think I don't think you're the only one I think lots of people are you know now we're all beginning to venture out again it's it is sort of slightly a mm. bit wary of going into spaces uh, but hopefully I mean I know that the you know the bigger film industry is is getting back out there and they are filming stuff so yeah uh, hopefully it won't be long before it kind of gets back to some kind of normality so creatively then how how do you uh, service your own sort of well-being and your own need to be creative what do you do for for fun creatively I, I enjoy I mean my surroundings are so beautiful and such an inspiration and, and actually I've just been home to Guernsey and spent a few months there as well so I do find that really sort of feeds my my soul the 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 views the vistas the walks um you know being surrounded by the kind of lush green the the sort of British countryside swimming in the sea um I've done a tiny tiny bit of winter swimming wild swimming um so I do, you know, I enjoy that as a bit of a kind of cathartic release. Um, and I just, yeah, I really enjoy sort of being around friends and family, even if it's over Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, and just being out and about. And I suppose I, I'm so lucky that I get to be creative in my work day and you know, bring, and I have a lot of clients who claim they're not creative and I really love being able to take something dry for, for you know, to use their terms that, that they give me and be able to sprinkle it with the creativity, with a little transition, a cut here, a bit of music there, a graphic, you know, and just being able to give them back something that, that they're kind of delighted with. That's, that's really lovely. So I suppose I'm so lucky I get to fulfill that in my, in my working life. Um, that I'm not sort of desperate, desperate for it uh, in my free time. Yeah. Have, do you think in lockdown, 
people people obviously are getting more used to using as you say using the technology that we've sort of all been forced into using but mm. do you think people now um are sort of getting more used to walking around with their phones and and how how can they use their smartphones to actually um enhance what it is that they're doing for their for their business well i mean number one yeah they've got you've got at your fingertips an amazing device that's really capable of quite a lot so so get to know it get you know figure out what every button does in your kind of camera apps in your photo apps in your editing apps um you know there's there's i you know i just say to people when you're when you're sat watching the tv and something you're half paying attention to something you know go into edit a photo press every button, slide every slider and see what it does. And it may, you know, our phones actually are capable of so much. They've got quite a lot of functionality. It may be that you decide, oh, I don't really like that effect. I don't like what it's doing. That's fine, but at least know what it does. And I think there's quite a lot of seduction to buy more kit, get, you know, pay for apps. First of all, just see what your camera and photo app within the phone can do what you can do with it and I think you're right people have just exploded in the last couple of years and I think lockdown taken it to another level the kind of creativity that you're seeing online on social media is phenomenal it's absolutely amazing and so much of it is created by your smartphone so if that intimidates you then you know forget it and just focus on what, what you can do for your business what it you know the very sort of simple bare essentials such as get yourself a tripod, set your phone up and just start talking to it. Or for those that are just really cannot bear the thought of going on camera, get behind the camera, you know, take the camera around and narrate something. This is my workspace. This is where I work. This is where I speak to clients. This is the table where I treat my clients, you know, whatever it is that they do. This is the view out of my window. This, this is the flower I've been growing and, you know, nurturing for ages. So, narrate and get used to just being get used to creating even if it's not your finest piece of work even you know and that's the beauty as well of smartphone and digital is just keep creating you can always look at it later and say okay i'm no, not going to post that and delete it but if you don't capture it you've got nothing to work with so get out get to know your phone and just get out there and capture everything all the time yeah Brilliant. I love that. And I, you know, that that's, I, I hadn't even really thought about standing behind the camera and doing, doing it from that way is, you know, people do get so intimidated being in front of the camera, but as you say, being behind it and, and playing, you know, playing it, being a, a filmmaker is, is perfect, isn't it? And my phone is absolutely chock-a-block. I went through the other night, all the videos that I've, <laughs> I've attempted, and I would say probably 80% of what I've I've got on my phone now of videos of me trying to promote my own business using using my smartphone. And um, I didn't use, I haven't, I haven't posted, but actually looking back at them, they were they were never as bad as I imagined they were. Yeah. And so, you know, looking back at them now, I think, oh, I should have posted that. Why didn't I? And there's just something that kind of stops us. And I think you're absolutely right. I think it is that perfectionism. And I think we are, we're all so concerned that we need to be that perfect, that uh, it blocks us from, from just playing. You know? and, and I think that's also the thing with social media. And, and a lot of our businesses do rely on you, social media. There's a sort of momentum. And, you know, if you don't go with it, you get stuck. And, and like you say, you look back and there's a whole lot of stuff you never posted and it feels like the moment's passed and, yeah. and weather was different. So I was wearing winter clothes and now it's spring and everyone will know. And it kind of, it, your stuff can feel quite dated quite quickly, but that's actually not the case. So I would, you know, that's very familiar to hear that there's, you know, there's stacks of stuff sitting in your camera roll. I would say to people, you know, go back and review it. And if you can use it, you know, post it. And if you're never going to post it, delete it. That's yeah. get rid of it because it starts to clog your phone up, but it starts to really clog up here where you just think, you know, I, I filmed something a couple of days ago. I'd love to go and, and, and dig it out and have a, have a review. And then suddenly it's buried under all the kind of hundreds more things you've done and filmed on top of it since then. And it becomes a real chore when you think, you know, I just can't be bothered to go back and review. I can't be bothered to go and find it. So keep on top of your own content, regularly review it, edit it, delete it, put it, save it in folders that relate to different projects or different social media platforms so that you make your own life easier yeah. um, to kind of, you know, work with that material. And just if you shot it, there was a reason you shot it. It's probably useful. Yeah. Out there. 
Yeah. I mean, it was one of the things when we very first went into lockdown, I, t I, it was one of the things that I was going to do. Definitely. I had to learn how to edit. Um, and I think maybe because I've, I've always sort of liked films and making films and obviously putting stuff together on a stage, I was found very easy. I was trying to then transfer it into film. So lockdown for me was a really good opportunity to think, right, well, I'm going to, I'm going to start trying that. Um, so I use iMovie because it's on my phone mm. and it's amazingly simple. I mean, it's so simple and yet it is so effective. Yeah. Um, so I just went onto YouTube and found some tutorial, you know, sat and watched a half an hour tutorial on how to use iMovie. And it just... There are there are loads of, uh, of videos out there. There's loads of apps out there. I use InShot um, quite a lot and particularly for beginners. The other thing as well is don't, you know, don't don't be don't underestimate the power of actually just trimming a video. So you know that bit where you start recording and you can see someone as they sort of reach out to press the button to press start and they sit back and they sort of do this. You know, even if you just trim those few seconds off and at the very end of the video, that's an edit. Yeah. You know, ta-da, that's done. And sometimes video doesn't need to be more complicated than just trimming the beginning and the end. It doesn't need all the bells and whistles all the time. So if you're new to video you know, don't let that stop you. You don't all have to become mini editors. Uh, you know, just learning the very, very basics can get you started. But yes, you will see what what simple a few edits here and there and a few little tricks can actually really do to kind of um, pep up a video. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, obviously I'm with you. I find it really fun and fascinating. Um, yeah. and, and as such, I run a couple of workshops. So one on filming and one on editing to help people like you know like yourself who haven't done it before but think this is a great way to be independent and to be able to still create yeah yeah do you think uh you can make too many videos for social media do you think you can be, you can be there too much is it i don't know actually i mean i i'm definitely not a social media expert as i think you can you can probably tell from my social media i'm so busy creating content for everyone else that i'm i'm um not very re reliable about creating it for myself um it it would appear that that would not be the case you know some some people out there are just creating content all day long i don't know how they have time for anything else um and i suppose for a lot of people that that is their job that is their kind of bread and butter now is to be an influencer and people are creating sort of really fun short pieces i think with things like TikTok and reels on instagram um, you know, these short little bite sized video clips, it doesn't seem like you can you can make too many. And I think, you know, there's this constant reinforcement that not everybody is seeing all your content, you know, and unless they're doing a real deep dive into your profile, it's unlikely they'll see everything that you do. So you could be creating and 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 only a small portion of your audience will see your message. So I mean, for me, for me personally, to be strategic with video, I think your video, this is for your business. I think your your video needs to have a, a goal. You know, what's the what's the call to action? What is it that you're trying to achieve with your video? What are you trying to show? What are you trying to say? So I wouldn't advise my clients to create video for video's sake because it is time consuming. It does take a lot of work. It does take a lot of thinking space and planning and and that kind of brainstorming and the editing and all the, you know, writing the post that goes with it. So if you're not just creating sort of fun TikToks for, you know, you know, then then actually what's your strategy? So save the time that you would pour into making a video if you don't know what your video is trying to achieve. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There's got to got to be a reason behind it. Absolutely. Um, so what's what's coming up next for, for Grub Productions? What, what are you what are you, you know, tell me what you're most looking forward to coming out of lockdown, actually? I mean, I know uh, you, you were quite a dancer. I mean, I certainly over the last I don't know if it's just I mean, I love dancing anyway. But yeah, somebody said uh, in a networking thing I was on, what would what would you be doing? What would be your um, dog chasing a ball moment? What would be that moment for you that just you kind of just lose it just playing? And for me, it is the dance floor. So is it is it the same for you? Yes. Yeah. Oh, gosh, I miss the dance floor. Um, so I, my tap classes will resume, which will be great fun. So I used to do loads and loads of dancing when I was when I was a kid sort of from the age of about three and um, not being sort of 
faux humble. I, I wasn't brilliant at it, but I just really, really enjoyed it. Um, and I'm not capable of kind of playing music. I, I, I People had to suffer through my piano scales for many years, but, but I really feel music and I really um, enjoy dancing to music and I find music really evo almost too evocative sometimes. Um, and so for me, like dancing is just such joy. So I did a load of it when I was a kid and, um, and used to do kind of ballet and, and to do dance festivals. And I went to dance camp in the summer and really, really loved it. And what's lovely as an adult is it's quite easy to pick up adult classes here and there. Um, and I've often found um, adult ballet classes quite easily, but, but tap is a bit rarer. And actually a, a lady moved to Purbeck about last year or the year before and started tap classes in my village. So I can just trot down the road with my tap shoes, which are so old, they're falling apart. And it just brings me so much joy. And I, I sort of feel like I'm 16 again. Yeah. and just have you know I can't my body doesn't do what it used to be able to do and I'm horribly unfit and very rusty and I think the styles really changed she said there's a, been a real American style influence um so I'm more I'm still a bit like upright and stiff and she's trying to teach us all how to to kind of relax so I just love it so I'm really looking forward to to the tap classes kind of resuming I think from from next week yeah Oh, that takes me back. I used to do tap up, up until I was about six, I think. I can remember my mum and dad taking a chest of drawers apart and I, I used to tap on the, the top, whatever was left of this chest of drawers and that was on the floor and I used to just practice my tap dancing on this, on this board, basically. Yeah, I was always sort of tapping around the kitchen and um, <laughs> I still do it now, actually, especially when my husband's not around. <laughs> Up. I think for me that that was that was that's sort of I suppose actually a bit of a creative outlet that I don't even think about is when I when I hear a piece of music I visualize dance steps and in my head I'm a much better dancer than I am in real life so in my head I'm doing all sorts of moves that I know I'm not capable of but but that's that's always been a sort of um just having that imagination to be uh to sort of be totally free with the music and yeah be creative so yeah I've really I've missed my tap classes and I'm yeah. looking forward to yeah no there's there's definitely something about that kind of uh the the self-expression just you know that kind of just allowing the music to kind of take over and you get that get that flow going where you know time sort of stands still really yeah and I think for me it was a real that's probably where I learned a lot in the very early days I mean a lot of people I speak to have real horror stories about dance schools when they were little and being told mean things but we just had the loveliest teachers and and I never you know never had any issues with body confidence or things like that and just being being encouraged to use your imagination and you today you're a flower today you're a fairy today you're in the woods you know and and having that little outlet, I suppose for me, it was the closest to theatre. I, I, I did a couple of school plays, but never, you know, for me, it was always through through dancing. And whenever we had a festival, I always got the kind of character dances. So I was a fisherman, a drunk gambler. Yeah. Uh, you know, I always, and I'd look at all my friends in their pretty dresses and tutus and, and never, you know, mine was always a sort of a costume and a character. And I remember when I was about 16, I was finally just, you know, they said, what would you like to do? And I said, I'd just like to wear a tutu. <laughs> <laughs> got me in a dress. <laughs> yeah, I just want to wear a girly outfit. And I mean, I did rubbish, you know, but I really enjoyed it. And but yeah, definitely the character and exploring character and being um, being sort of set loose to do that and not yeah. feeling, you know, self-conscious about it because it's just the world that you that you were in, I suppose. Yeah. Oh, kind of I bang on about playing as an adult all the time because to me it you know we we stop playing you know we have that freedom and I was to one of my other podcast guests Tom that was out this week uh, he had he, he said the thing that um, as a child we explore we use our brains to explore but as an adult it, we use our brains to exploit and there's that kind of transition from being a child where you're just exploring and you're curious and you're and you're playing, mm. uh, which is how we learn. Basically, uh, once you get to adulthood, we kind of stop doing that. And I mean, it's fantastic that you're still continuing doing tap and doing the things that you loved as a child, because we need to bring more of that into our adult lives. And I think I think people would feel um, more comfortable in front of a camera or on a stage speaking, if they could play more, because it's not about perfection. It's not, you know, it's about making it up as you go along. It's about falling over, failing, and then getting up and, and starting all over again. So, yeah. 
Yeah, and just being you and being authentic. And I think that's something perhaps people struggle with is this idea that I've got to be the best version of me. I've got to be on form, on top of my game on this video. And actually, that's not necessarily who we are all the time. Mm. You know, we do we do make mistakes. We do get things wrong. And like you say, we just got to pick up and, and carry on. So I think filming doesn't need to be as intimidating as it as it appears to be. It's just capturing who you are yeah. um, so that you can communicate. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's exactly going back to, you know, you, you capturing that moment with that tiger. It is, it is that moment in time. But if if you don't capture it, it's gone. You know, mm. we, we can't kind of store everything in our memories. You know, it's great to have those things. And as I say, looking back at the videos and the, and the images of myself over the last year, I've been quite pleased at what I've looked at. And I do wish that I'd actually posted a few more because, you know, I, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, I don't always, um, I don't, I preach, I don't do, oh. Don't always practice what you preach. That's the one, <laughs> don't always practice what I preach. Um, so yes, we are coming out of lockdown. Where is Grub Productions going from here? So what is, what is up next? And because you're working with small businesses, are you gonna, will you be continuing? Yes, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm looking forward to hopefully a few more filming projects kind of coming back back onto the the calendar as, as people. Although I could be filming, I think a lot of people don't want us in their kind of workspace um, or or want to have that kind of proximity at the moment. So I'd love to get back out and do some filming. I've got a really nice collaboration with um, food a uh, food works coming up in the summer where I'm doing a sort of four part series, uh, which is all about food video food styling food photography with smartphones so that's really fun that's a new challenge to kind of set my teeth into and I'll just keep running my video smartphone workshops as well and um, getting people for, who are you know completely brand new to video who haven't done any and getting them to the point where they feel comfortable to to film for their businesses and and get out there with their messaging so um yeah just not not being you know restricted by by the lockdown will just be so lovely and refreshing yeah. won't it we'll all rush yeah. out there and yeah, it will. Can't wait. So if, if people want to get in touch with you and find out where they, you know, what they can do with you and how you can work together, where would they find you? I've actually put your Instagram on my board. Oh, yes. It's Grub Productions. Oh, I looked up and it's oh, a that, Grub Pro. That might be someone else. <gasps> oh, <laughs> ignore that. Ignore that. Just <laughs> Oh. Or just just add on ductions yeah. so yeah gr uh, at grub productions on facebook and instagram and my email address is georgina at grubproductions.co.uk so feel free to get in touch if you are looking for video strategy smartphone training filming editing any of the above marvelous oh i might have to get you around do some do some filming Put me out there. <laughs> See, that's what I need. I'm, I'm, I'm okay in front of a camera. I just need somebody to do all the, all the bits. So yeah, we might well, have there, a conversation. There is a lot to think about. So yeah, I think, it, it, I think sort of having an extra pair of hands there really helps, even if you know what you're doing. Just yeah. And also someone just to gently go, right, let's stop procrastinating. Let's do it. Let's get on with it. Yes. Well, brilliant. Thank you so much for, for joining me today, Georgina. It's been amazing to talk to you. Lovely, lovely, lovely. To talk to you and I love your background as well it's very mine's a bit busy is, is that something else you have to talk to people about what's in their backgrounds yes I do actually and and just say well number one is it sort of um does it have the same me message so if you are a, a health nutrition expert and you've got sweet wrappers and coke cans in the background you know does it contradict your message but also just is it a bit a bit busy or or off-putting but mine's always changing I don't know if you're like that, like, you know, the plant will appear in a different place. <laughs> yeah. That's because I'm always moving things around all the time. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, I kind of try to keep it the same for the podcast so that it kind of, you know, there's the name and the board. And so people kind of yeah. get to get to recognize it. But yeah, it is looking a bit um, compared to your nice white space. It's looking a bit, <laughs> a bit shabby chic, should we say? <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'll, I'll let you go. And uh, thank you so much for your time. And I'll, uh, I'll speak to you very soon. You're welcome. Thank you for having me.